Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the very first Progressive International Forum. The goal of these forums is to introduce uh, Progressive International members and beyond to the, the work of our collaborators all around the world and the particular struggles they're facing in local communities and individual countries around the world and to facilitate a real deep and meaningful internationalist exchange so that we're learning from each other as well as getting a much deeper understanding of what's happening uh, beyond the limits of our own community, beyond our own nation. Today, I'm very, very pleased to be joined uh, by two members of one of our sort of most treasured partner, partner organizations, Al Shabaka, the, the Palestinian Policy Network. And the framing for our discussion today is, uh, is imagining a Palestinian future. And the reason why we're talking today about imagining a Palestinian future is because as we enter the eighth decade of the Nakba, this ongoing process of ethnic cleansing, of annexation, of increasing incarceration of the Palestinian population, it's never been more difficult to imagine a Palestinian future. And the goal of this session is going to be thinking about how we can de-exceptionalize the Palestinian struggle, by which we mean moving away from a framing of the question of justice in Palestine as a particular exceptional case to one that is representative and integral to a much more international struggle for justice, as well as re-internationalizing the Palestinian struggle and thinking about how an organization an institution like the Progressive International recently launched can be a vehicle for internationalizing that struggle uh, and combating the global shift towards the far right that has made the prospect of justice and a bright future in Palestine um, ever dimmer. So I'm joined today by two members of the Al Shabaka Network. Yara Hawari is a senior Palestine policy fellow at Al Shabaka. She completed her PhD in Middle East Studies at the University of Exeter where she taught various undergraduate courses and continues to be an honorary research fellow. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to, to the PI Forum. Thank you so much for joining us from Ramola. Thank you for having me. Um, Are we back? The second guest I'm very pleased to welcome today is, is Rhonda, who's a PhD candidate in anthropology at, at Harvard. Her dissertation is going to explore how Israel uses uh, and exploits Palestinian bodies to surveil, control, and continuously dispossess and incarcerate the Palestinian population. Ron is also a member of the Al Shabaka Network and, and writes frequently for the institution. Thank you both uh, very much for joining me. Uh, we have a, a lot to talk about today, and I think it's going to be a, a wide ranging and, and very inspiring conversation. I know that from discussions we've had. Um, already. So just to kick us off in terms of the, the first of the two-pronged discussion that we were going to have today, the first piece is about de-exceptionalizing the Palestinian struggle. Um, and I want to ask, you know, how do we unpack that word? What exactly does it mean to be exceptionalized? Maybe you can give us some more history. How did the case of Palestine become exceptional in the first place? And how can we think concretely through ways in our activism, both in places like Ramallah and uh, as well as, you know, from wherever we're sitting and watching this broadcast, what it might mean to de-exceptionalize the Palestinian struggle along the way. Yeah, David, and thank you for, for that introduction. And you're right, I think when we're talking about de-exceptionalization, we do, we do need to go back and look at the history and think about um, the framework. And, and you mentioned the Nakba, um, and I think it's pertinent probably here to mention what the Nakba means for the Palestinian people. The Nakba uh, refers both to the year of 1948, which saw the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, the wiping off of Palestine um, from the maps, um, but it also refers to an ongoing process of settler colonialism that actually began well before that date and continues uh, today. Now, in 1948, we saw Israel literally established on top of Palestine, forcing um, about 750 Palestinians, uh, 750,000 Palestinians into exile, uh, destroying over 400 Palestinian towns and villages. Um, and not only, you know, did the landscape go under huge upheaval, so too did the narrative of the land. And, and it soon became as if Palestine had never existed at all. So when we talk about the, the ongoing Nakba, it's this continuous process, this continuous process of land theft, 
uh, which some of which is understood in, in, in very legal jargon, such as annexation, as you mentioned, David, but also we're talking about mass incarceration of, of Palestinians, of uh, the ghettoization of Palestinian communities, massacres, uh, uh, and many other violent mechanisms of erasure by the settler colonial regime. Um, now, the analysis of Israel as a settler colonial enterprise, it, it's not a new one, uh, but it has exploded over the academic scene, certainly over the last decade. And I think it's important here to mention how settler colonial regimes are different to sort of tr more traditional colonial ones. A settler colonial regime dominates to erase and es essentially seeks to replace the indigenous population, whilst a colonial regime seeks to dominate to exploit the native population for the motherland or the, the sort of imperial uh, body. Um, and it's this relationship between traditional um, between the, the, the settler and the indigenous and the, the colonizer and the native that makes a difference. Now in Palestine, we saw it begin before 1948 when early Zionists began settling the land, but it was institutionalized um, with the establishment of the state of Israel um, as a Jewish, exclusively Jewish state. And it has since continued to expand onto Palestinian land um, through um, different mechanisms of, of, of theft. And in 1967, it expanded to what be, onto what became known as the Occupied Palestinian Territories and the Syrian Golan. Now, it's continued to try and subdue and dominate the indigenous people uh, through various mechanisms, uh, one of which is the system of apartheid, which um, I, I want to stress is not just about the separation of people, but rather it's, it's that very separation that's used to enshrine economic and social dominance of one group over another. And rather ironically, uh, South African apartheid was also institutionalized and enshrined in, in 1948. Now, uh, cases of settler colonialism all have their peculiarities and different characteristics. Um, and, and while some of those, those characteristics are unique to the experience in Palestine, it's important to note that the Zionist project is not exceptional. It actually follows um, a very common pattern of European invasion and, and domination. Now, as I said earlier, that this isn't really a new analysis, it, it's rather a revived one. And in the decades following the 1948 Nakba, a lot of Palestinian scholars and revolutionaries engaged with this settler uh, colonial analytic. Um, one of the first papers that was written was in 67, uh, 1965 by um, Fayez Sayah, who uh, described Israel as a settler colonial state. Um, and there was a lot of other scholarship that, that followed but these early works were important because they were tied to the political project of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, whose goal at the time in the 60s and 70s was to liberate all of historic Palestine from Zionist settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was essentially revolutionary scholarship, which a lot of indigenous and native uh, scholarship was at the time. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, the Palestinian Liberation Organization actually modeled itself, its agenda, its goals, its tactics on another struggle against settler colonialism, and that's the, the Algerian struggle uh, and the FLN, the Algerian Front uh, for Liberation, which, had, uh, which essentially triumphed over French settlers. Um, and the PLO, you know, they identified similar structures of invasion and they sought camaraderie and expertise from Algerian leaders. And as did Black Panthers at the time and revolutionaries from Latin America. So much so that um, Amalka Cabral, the, the Pan-African revolutionary, once said that Muslims make the pilgrimage to Mecca, Christians to the Vatican and national liberation movements to Algiers. Um, and, and after liberation, Algeria actually did open its doors to revolutionaries around the world. And this, this was a period, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because this was a period that really embodied the spirit of internationalism. And importantly, anti-colonial struggle was, was really at the heart of it. Um, so, you know, a lot has happened since then, the 60s and 70s, and we can be very nostalgic about it. Um, but I think that historical perspective is important. Um, to look at those historical ties and links that Palestinians had with re revolutionaries around the world, it's really the foundation for a sort of revived internationalism. Now, a lot of these connections um, have weakened, and especially with the onset of neoliberalism and, and policies of de-development, which, which really have insisted on it, depoliticization um, of, of countries, of, of civil societies. 
um, but with specificity, specificity to Palestine, there was this distinct narrative shift um, that began this process of depoliticization uh, and um, breaking of these internationalist ties. Uh, and we can sort of identify this mostly with the Oslo Accords, the onset of the Oslo Accords in the early 1990s, that famous peace agreement, um, which I'm sure many of you remember the picture of, it's that Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister, and the PLO Chairman uh, Yasser Arafat shaking hands on, on the White House lawn, flanked by this very smug looking Bill Clinton. Um, they really set in motion for the framing of Israel and Palestine as one of two warring nations that would find peace uh, through a two-state paradigm. Uh, and this actually you know, remains to be a very dominant narrative, um, even among you know, liberals and progressives, this idea that both sides need to put down their arms uh, and talk to one another. Now, the problem with this narrative is that it completely disregards the power imbalance at hand. The, the promise of the Oslo Accords was that the Palestinians would eventually get state after going through this staged uh, sort of preparations by outside donors and, and actors, and that the state would be in the West Bank and Gaza. So the, the Palestinian land occupied in 1967, not in 1948. Uh, and, and the PLO, uh, led by Yasser Arafat, agreed to these conditions. And at the time, um, Edward Said, the, this leading Palestinian scholar, called it a, uh, a capitulation, basically a Palestinian Versailles. Um, so it was it was a great moment in in Palestinian history, and great not not to say not to say it, to refer to it positively, but a very uh, consequential moment. What we saw was a revolutionary movement shift its discourse and policies from from one of liberation and anti-colonial struggle to that of of state building in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. So really reducing uh, what Palestine would look like um, uh, and ignoring sort of Palestinians outside of those spaces, such as Palestinian refugees in exile and the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and this was a shift that also, uh, this narrative shift also shifted in, in Palestinian civil society. Um, uh, uh, and not only that, much more recently in 2008, the Palestinian Authority adopted a new economic program called the Palestinian uh, Reform and Development Plan, which was developed with the likes of the World Bank and, and DFID. And this plan basically really embraced neoliberalism. Um, in other words, private sector driven, um, driven economy and a focus on attracting foreign investment and, and a reduction in public spending. Um, so national discourse has now, uh, Palestinian national discourse has no longer become about collective liberation, but rather about individual success uh, and capital gain. And this is coupled with an increasingly authoritarian regime, um, um, the Palestinian Authority, that has basically rendered the Palestinian, the so-called Palestinian leadership as complicit with the oppression of their people. And unfortunately, this is similar to so many other regimes um, uh, of colonized people. And we know often in settler colonial and colonial contexts that uh, dominating systems often recruit uh, natives and indigenous people to, to suppress their own. Now, I've sort of thrown a lot of historical context, I hope succinctly, um, as a, really a way to frame today and to understand Palestinians as indigenous people, as people suffering from ongoing settler colonial invasion. Uh, and I think it's important because indigeneity is a paradigm um, uh, and as an identity really offers a, a, you know, a focus and recentering of indigenous people, um, you know, and it, it, it places indigenous knowledge and understanding uh, and particularly resistance to invasion and attempts at erasure at, at its core. Um, and I think in essence, it really offers a radical rethinking of knowledge and uh, knowledge production. So I'll stop there and maybe uh, we can hear a bit more from, from Randa. Thank you so much, Yara, for giving us the backbone um, of this movement and really diagnosing what um, has been happening um, in the last few decades. I just, uh, I'm just thinking about the last things that you were saying, which is thinking about how we really need to center on indigeneity and really reframe and restructure this movement as one of, um, that is of settler colonial takeover. And I'm reminded of, um, 
uh, the late scholar Patrick Wolf's statement when talking about settler colonialism, that invasion is a structure and not an event. And like you've outlined, we have to recognize that settler colonialism is very much a part of our present. It's embedded in the straight state structures that are governing and controlling Palestinian life and Palestinian death. And therefore, you know, I think we have to see and understand the Nakba as this foundational moment in 1948, also as a structure and not an event that is integral to Israeli settler colonialism and Zionist principles and is embedded in the everyday present for Palestinians. So um, thank you for setting us up for that. I think also like we, in thinking about the Nakba as a structure and not just as an event that took place in 1948 that we commemorate, we can see it unfolding every day in the judicial workings of the Israeli state. And I know you can speak more to this about um, when the Israeli legislature passed in 2011, the what is called the Nekbe law, which is a law that criminalizes and penalizes any actions of individuals or organizations that are seen as, and I quote, rejecting the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish democratic state, thereby erasing the history and the heritage of Palestinianists on the land, erasing the population of 20% who are now uh, citizens of Israel, and even more blatantly, when we, um, you know, uh, pan out and look at the Israeli military courts that are used to imprison Palestinians under 1600 military codes that range from, uh, you know, infringement on free speech of membership to political parties, things that we really take for granted in other places like in the United States, for example, or even being involved in student activism and a host of infringement on all civil and political rights that are criminalized. And these are really ways that are used to criminalize resistance and to keep uh, the memory of the Nakba um, suppressed and to, and to keep Palestinians from returning to their land or from demanding dignity and rights. Um, so I think that these judicial policies are coupled with U.S. sanction annexation, and they're all part of this embedded structure to continue to eliminate Palestinians from the land and also to try to erase Palestinian identity. And we know, you know, like as much as Israel has tried to erase Palestinian history from the land through legal processes, through incarceration, through trying to silence Palestinians, through extrajudicial killings, you can still visually see traces of the Nakba everywhere, which is why I want to continue to emphasize the structuralness of this. For example, if you're like in um, public parks, like um, in the northern border with Lebanon, you see the destroyed homes of villages like Kufur Bir'am, where their roofs were caved in in aerial bombings after 1948. When you're driving around in the West Bank, you can see Arabic, Arabic inscriptions on road signs being graffitied out or the names being changed and anglicized to the English name. For example, the um, Jerusalem, instead of being called Al-Quds, like we call it in Arabic, is changed to Yerushalim in English. Um, and so we see in West Jerusalem, for example, um, Palestinian homes that have the name of the families or the year that they were built or the Fatah have written on inscriptions on the door are now um, family homes or have become shoe stores and have Israeli flags hanging out of their windows. And even if you go deeper into the West Bank, you see all Palestinian homes have water tanks on top of them because Israel has really diverted natural springs to nearby settlements, making the region water scarce, but only for Palestinians. So even at this point, there is a constant dispossession of our land, of our natural resources, of our identity. Um, and you also see like in cities like Nablus or across Ramallah photos of dead teenagers who were killed by Israeli snipers, who were tear gas, who are forever memorialized as martyrs for the national liberation cause. So my point is basically that on every scale, we see the neck of it everywhere and it's ever present. And, you know, like around this time of year, we often commemorate the Nakba on May 15th. And I often I'm trying to reflect and think about how did we get here? Why have things not progressed forward? And and quite the opposite, we are uh, seeing that things are maybe getting worse. Around the, uh, around the day of the Nakba, there were uh, family homes of prisoners who were being demolished as a punitive measure. 
Um, we know that um, Netanyahu is continuing on with the annexation plan by July 1st. And so thinking about um, this, we really do have to restructure, as you say, how we think about internationalism as a way forward. And you were talking about how there's been this turn to capitalism and neoliberalism and all, there's also been since even just before also, but this turn of thinking about internationalism as expressed through diplomatic and liberal relationships between states in which states enter into covenants with one another to cooperate, to set treaties with one another and work towards these supposed common goals of prosperity and peace. And we see this through the United Nations. We see this through cooperation programs with the ICRC, with the European Union. And we know um, that the Palestinian leadership has attempted to use this avenue to gain recognition through the United Nations, to be seen as a people, to, to uh, push forward resolutions that are supposed to uphold Palestinian rights and have either been, and in these, in this case, they've either been sabotaged or they failed at turning these declarations that are made in the United Nations into true action on the ground and into stopping violence or land seizures or the killings or incarceration of Palestinians. So then I think the major question that we're reaching right now when thinking about internationalism is what is third state responsibility? And, um, the Palestinian leadership has been constantly calling for upholding third state responsibility. And these states themselves have signed multitudes of conventions on human rights about the rights of the child, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture, the Rights of Women, the Fourth Geneva Conventions, and so on. But they haven't actually acted on intervening on Israeli practices that violate these conventions to the point that they're being investigated as war crimes. Um, so I think that this is one of the questions that we're facing today in our movement is that the international law has become a barometer of our rights and has pigeonholed what is possible for us in the political movement and what is possibly attainable and realizable rather than looking at what our future and liberation should and can look like. And I think this is the major folly of this type of diplomatic internationalism is that bureaucracy and the lack of action or real genuine third state responsibility to stop this type of violence and impunity has not been made. And the system is designed this way. It's designed to be bureaucratic. It's designed to be slow. It's designed not to actually take action and to make indigenous and oppressed people lose vision of what our rights are, what di our dignity is. And they're, they're just making us fight for scraps rather than what we deserve, which is to return to our land and to live in dignity and freedom and safety. Um, I think in the last year, and I know Yada, you might want to jump in and talk about this more, is that there has been, I, like we experienced a major failure of third state responsibility and this crystallized when Trump announced his plan um, at the end of January to effectively annex the rest of the West Bank to Israel. He moved the, um, the American embassy to Jerusalem um, and, and the international community has largely remained silent on this. Um, and Israel continues to be treated as a full voting member of the United Nations, um, continues to participate in the international arena normally. Their violence has been normalized, as has this many states' violence. And so these international processes have failed to safeguard even the most basic tenets of human rights and dignity that they claim to espouse. So we do have to shift our focus from understanding international solidarity and where we put our labor in these movements should not be as a form of legal intervention or um, upholding treaty bound obligations as a primary focus of demanding our peace and security, but rather reshift to an internationalism that centers on grassroots, wide scale indigenous liberation movements that uphold and center freedom as our guiding star and one that unifies people, liberation movements, and what we envision and what we determine as what is liberation, safe, justice oriented, our returns to our land and what we see as a healthy and vibrant global community. I know um, we're short on time, David, and we probably want to move on, but I just wanted to add just a minute, um, just a quick comment to what Amanda um, said so, so brilliantly. 
Um, I think a lot of people are feeling, especially on the left, a lot of progressives and a lot of radicals are feeling um, quite downhearted and, and depressed because of the, the global political situation and, and there is grounds for it. It is um, a very deeply depressing time. But I think when, you know, at times like this, there's also opportunities and avenues. And I think, um, you know, just as there are sort of intertwining structures of oppression, so too should there be intertwining structures of solidarity and resistance. So when we think about, you know, all the oppressive uh, mechanisms and tools that are, that are used to suppress the Palestinian people, they're also used in, in many other contexts around the world. Um, for Just to give you some examples, you know, the, the arms trade, uh, security companies, um, uh, surveillance technologies, the, the ones that are used here are also used elsewhere. You know, um, some of, uh, another example, some of the American police uh, that we used uh, to put down uh, protests in, in Ferguson were actually trained in Israel. The electric smart fences, um, or so-called smart fences that you find at the, the border between Mexico and the US are also found um, uh, in Gaza um, and are used by the Israeli military. So all this is to say that you know this isn't this is part of our de-exceptionalization. You know, if we think bigger, I think there is more room uh, for hope. If we think, you know, about targeting um, these the, these companies, um, these structures uh, on a much more sort of holistic, in a much more holistic way, I think there is there is more hope and there is more room for maneuver. But we have to do it, you know, as 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 in as 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 uh, sort of internationalists, not as insular, and not thinking about Palestine as sort of something far away and, and something that doesn't affect others, because Palestine is essentially a testing lab for a lot of these structures of oppression. The weapons, the chemicals that they use against us here, they'll use, they test them here, and then they show that they're battle-tested. That's the word that these Israeli companies use. Um, so I think drawing all these links are very important in terms of moving forward for solidarity. Absolutely. And just to add on that, so the company that is uh, exporting um, the tear gas canisters, Combined Tactical Systems, which is based in um, Pennsylvania, is also selling weapons that are being used in Egypt, Tunisia, Chile, Bolivia, Guatemala, Germany, Netherlands, India, Hong Kong, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Cameroon. They're being used globally. And, you know, the, the, these um, police exchanges are really interesting. I think that American police, and this has been going on since at least 2002, where thousands of um, police academies have been trained in Israel by the intelligence units, by, um, by the military, and we're seeing globally a more militarized police force. And Israel did not invent these strategies and export them across the world, because we know that the U.S. has a long history of racist and violent policing that dates back to the slave patrols in the Antebellum South, and to the Black Codes, and to the ways that convict labor has been used into the present day prison industrial complex. But I think what's really important to look at these exchanges is that they indicate how states themselves see policing and incarceration as a global tactic and as a global strategy to, first of all, maintain their sovereignty, to maintain the status quo, to quell any kind of resistance, and secondly, to criminalize unwanted populations on a global scale to create an anti-Black, anti-Palestinian world. Um, and these the economic entanglements on top of that um, on the state and private le levels makes it impossible for us to turn to states to actually uphold uh, rights, but rather for us to see these joint struggles and see that these, um, these forms of policing and incarceration are being used on us globally. I just want to note that when, when Yara started speaking, she said, uh, I know you're feeling depressed, but actually there's good news. And then immediately turned to the global, uh, the global stakes of, uh, you know, shared tactics across these borders. And I completely share, uh, share that assessment. I think it speaks a lot to the motivation of this initiative, which is to say, um, you know, we're not up against a, a fragmented enemy and, and it's and I don't think it's exclusive to the far right I think what you've identified both of you it seems like in the discussion we've had so far is that when it comes to the case of Palestine there are threats that are emerging from the kind of you know more uh, let's say 
sort of globalization with a human face as it was being pitched in the 1990s and, and advanced by the Bretton Woods institutions and others to try to say liberalization is a, a key to peace and, and, and solidarity in a way, that that was you know, hugely destructive to the cause of Palestine and just, uh, to cause of justice in Palestine at the same time as this outright xenophobic right-wing agenda that's about advancing without any of that human face or without any of the olive branch imagery um, the active uh, sort of annexation, uh, dispossession, and criminalization of these populations is, you know, that's the motivation for why we think it's so important to, to bring these movements together. So moving now, you know, to following your lead away from the question of de-exceptionalization, which I think you situated perfectly, towards this question of re-internationalization. Now, Rhonda, you've already given us several avenues towards how we might think about, from an activist perspective, I mean, for in, for in the question of, you know, people who are watching this broadcast, who want to do something in, in their community and want to think about a way to make, as we often say inside of Progressive International, to make their solidarity more than a slogan, more than a tweet, more than a post. You know, how can we think about ways to, to bring those movements together uh, for indigenous rights and for, for land justice that you mentioned uh, and, and braid the, the actual activism? You know, is it, is it going after those companies? How, is there a broader framework under which we can understand it? And, and just as importantly, are there types of activism that you feel like are prevalent now um, and that, that you think are either counterproductive or kind of red herrings in, in the pursuit of um, this you know, common goal for, of, of justice um, for indigenous communities around the world? Um, I'll just, I'll start maybe Randa. I have just a, um, a few short things to say. Um, about that. I think I think one of the key things is to think about what we mean as internationalism. I think that word um, has very much has very much been lost in favor of sort of uh, sort of a more more liberal narrative. Um, there's a common phrase actually that that's used in the, the, the Palestinian solidarity movement, which is progressive except for Palestine, PEP for short. And and you find that quite a lot, you know, people will be um, for um, uh, indigenous rights and they will be uh, talking about racial ju justice and economic justice and then there's a sort of black hole when it comes to to palestine um, there's a sort of this this taboo um, that people are either afraid to talk about or or quite frankly they they don't see palestinians as as human beings of deserving of uh, of equal rights and um, unfortunately there is a lot of discourse nowadays a lot of the ways that Palestinians are talked about in the mainstream media, mainstream political spaces that talk about Palestinians as sort of uh, petulant children that uh, need to behave in order to um, to be granted any sort of any, any you know any rights at all. Um, you know, Palestinians must put down their arms. Palestinians must do this. They must do this before they are granted, and that's that's not the case. You know, Palestinians are uh, deserving of their rights no matter uh, what they do, as are all people in, in the world. So I, I think we have to, you know, sort of break those those liberal discourses that are sort of really trying to, to, to exceptionalize um, Palestine and, and really to, to think about what internationalism means. Go back to those, uh, you know, revolutionaries who talked about internationalism as a, as a, you know, as political solidarity and joint struggle that really transcends nation state borders. Um, and it's certainly not about globalism. Uh, you know, for the left, internationalism, internationalism is you know it's a is a revolutionary ideology it's it's work it's a working class and uh, an anti-imperialist tradition and i think it's it's key you know to go back to that and and to remember that um and to think about how uh colonialism capitalism and patriarchy sort of all work together to to oppress people i think is 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 incredibly um, important and I and I do feel like in the case of Palestine that capitalism is often one structure that's that's sort of forgotten about or not paid enough attention to um, and just to bring in very briefly the example of South Africa um, when we look at um, how the end of apartheid was brought about and um, there were several reasons that it, that that um, that political apartheid ended um, the struggle of the ANC and the boycott movement. Um, but one of the main problems that a lot of people um, who fought against apartheid will tell, tell you today, that economic apartheid did not end. There is still a form of racial capitalism that is alive and well, and that simply continued in South Africa 
So the inequalities um, still exist, and that's something that I am constantly worried about in Palestine is that the, the sort of discussion about um, apartheid is an important one, um, but it can't be separated from the overall framework of, of settler colonialism and racial capitalism, where, you know, Palestinians, um, um, you know, uh, even, you know, brought into to oppressing or even complicit in oppressing themselves um, um, uh, through capitalism and neoliberal, neoliberal policies. Randa, do you have uh, something you want to add? Yeah, I just think, um, I just keep coming back to thinking about policing and incarceration as something to tackle is because I'm really often um, when thinking about the way forward thinking um, from an abolitionist perspective of how can we envision a world without prisons, a world where we cage people. And this for me is coming particularly to light right now during the coronavirus pandemic when we're seeing a lot of um, uh, cross solidarity around the world and all of these uplifting um, stories about people coming together and showing care for each other while simultaneously uh, we're seeing we know that prisoners are actually being treated more and more with lack of dignity during this moment and it really brings to light how we can really make some people unhuman. Um, and for example, in the United States, we know that there's a lot of prisons where coronavirus is spreading rapidly and there's still medical negligence. People are not allowed to talk to their families. Um, people are not allowed to uh, communicate with their lawyers uh, and they're in overcrowded spaces with no hygiene, sanitation products. The same thing is happening in Palestine, um, just as this pandemic and we're being told to social distance and to stay away from people, ICE is ramping up its raids in the United States, just as the Israeli military is also ramping up its arrests of Palestinians. We know at least 400 Palestinians have been arrested since the beginning of coronavirus. So I think really that like coming um, an international perspective really needs to center um, a concept of creating a um, a future and a blueprint for what a world without prisons looks like because it tells us a lot about how we treat uh, dignity, how we can create a politics of care across cultures, across communities, and how we can really um, think about uh, dismantling borders among people and among states. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that uh, that's a really, you know, I think, we, first of all, we could talk for much, much longer about the, the meanings and misuses of internationalism. I think it's something that we're going to have to explore a lot in this project. If we want to lay a legitimate claim to this mantle of internationalism, we're going to have to continue to uh, mine the depths of that concept and explore its variety. And something that I've been, you know, reading a lot and writing a lot about is, is thinking about how that that concept has evolved and evolved to match the various phases of, of, of capitalism and, and, and its counter counterform in, in the more liberal internationalist view that, that you're right to say took the helm in the past 25 years or so. So it's something that I think, you know, we would hope to have an open dialogue about in terms of how we can deliver on that revolutionary promise that Dara, you mentioned. I think that with the remaining time we have, you know, I do want to, you know, we've set the stage here and talking so much about these two prongs, it's the essential it sort of set us up to know that you know Palestine is not an exception, at the same time uh, to resolve the the problems that are even particular to Palestine, they cannot be solved in isolation. They're going to require us to be targeting uh, these more uh, planetary systems, global systems that oppress indigenous populations everywhere. But I think it brings us to this question of what does it mean to imagine a future? What does it mean to imagine a future for Palestine? And I want to ask you both you know, to explain the, the concept and the challenge. I mean, why? Why at this particular moment? We, we talked a lot about, about the Nakba and, and what it meant then and what it has meant since. Why is it so challenging to imagine a Palestinian future? And I think that, you know, when I first was thinking about the framing of the, of the event, I was also just thinking about, you know, what is a future? It's not just in the case of Palestine that we're talking about a future. We also live in a moment where this question of, of, of a changing climate and the question of, of extinction. You know, we, are, we talk a lot about it's either internationalism or it's going to be extinction. You know, we're talking in a very serious way for the first time about the end of a kind of capitalist expansion, accumulation where the horizon is always pushing outward towards the possibility of an extinguished future. And certainly in the context of the pandemic, 
the question of survival uh, in terms of our species and also our existence on the planet is once again in question. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, either would be happy for you to take the floor, either of you, but I'm curious if you could say a bit about, you know, the, the pieces of that, of that phrase. What is a future? What does it mean to imagine a future? And then what does it mean to imagine a Palestinian future in particular? And just say very quickly, um, I think one of the challenges that we have is, uh, for Palestinians particularly, is the deliberate fragmentation of our people. Um, there are 7 million Palestinians that are living in exile or in diaspora across the world, which is actually the same amount of Palestinians living inside um, uh, Palestine. Um, and we have been deliberately fragmented, whether um, being expelled in 1948, whether through the like insanely complex uh, ID system and permit regime that we live under where we cannot even en enter different parts of Palestine or marry someone with a different identification card. Um, we are fragmented by um, Palestinians still to this day living, millions of them, in refugee camps in the Arab world. And this has been, and this is part of settler colonialism and the Nakba as a structure to try to fragment us by class, by the use of patriarchy, by neoliberalism, in order to make sure that we cannot um, collectively come together. But I'm trying to see and um, reshape this to think that what our biggest challenge is also one of our greatest strengths is that we have 7 million Palestinians living across the globe, experiencing different contexts, different movements, working in different spaces. Um, the Dream Defenders has one of the founders was a Palestinian working on um, anti-policing in Florida. Um, we have Palestinians who are working very closely in solidarity with indigenous movements in California through the Palestinian youth uh, movement. Um, and so we can really use this and harness this power of Palestinians living in exile to learn and to teach and to be in struggle with others so that we can actually create this grassroots internationalist um, movement that is about um, cross exchange and about working together for a freer world. Yeah, thanks for that, Randa. Um, I think, you know, I think it is hard for Palestinians to think about a future. And I think there are many reasons for that. And one of them is because of the daily struggle is, is so difficult, um, especially for many Palestinians, you know, in, in, pre you know, particularly precarious situations, be that, be that in refugee camps or in, in the land of Palestine, where, you know, really just getting by day to day sort of takes priority. But I think it's also important to note that this is by design as well. I mean, this is, you know, part of the settler colonial process is that to, to bog the indigenous people down with, you know, just just the, the, the sheer, you know, struggle of staying alive and existing so that they can't, you know, resist the sort of wider structure. Um, the problem is in that, you know, in, in most mainstream places, places and, and, and spaces, uh, Palestinian futures are often discussed, you know, without their input or, or with very limited frameworks. Uh, and the most recent and egregious of all of these was, of course, the Trump plan, which was presented at the start of the year. And it was the title of the plan is actually, you know, the Trump vision uh, for uh, peace and prosperity. Um, and, um, you know, it, I think people were so, especially progressives, were so offended by it. But I think it's important to note that this, this plan didn't radically break from what has previously been presented to Palestinians as possible futures. Actually, it, it, it follows the traditional peace, you know, all the traditional peace proposals over the past, you know, few decades in which Palestinian futures have not been premised on fundamental rights and, and aspirations of sovereignty. Um, they've actually been totally dis disregarding of, of, of rights and sovereignty. Um, the, the different thing about the Trump plan is that, you know, some, some actually argue that it was simply more candid than, than other peace, so-called peace efforts before it. It really, you know, blatantly depicts uh, what the US and Israel um, considers a sort of acceptable form of Palestinian existence. Um, and, and what this plan and all those before it really demonstrates is that the containment of indigenous Palestinians and 
um, security for the settler state, the state of Israel, are the primary concerns when it comes to imagining a future. Um, and this is why it is difficult for Palestinians to think about a just future. Um, Franz Fanon wrote um, that French colonialism in Algeria always developed on this assumption that it would last forever, that colonial infrastructure um, that was built um, all gave this impression that, that a rupture in the colonial time was impossible. Uh, and, and, and similarly, Israel creates these facts on the ground through settlement building in the West Bank, appropriation of land across the Green Line, and the constant moving of the boundaries of what is accepted as Israeli land. All of this, you know, really um, cements Israel as a sort of, you know, uh, as an imperial uh, regime that will last forever. And one of the main arguments that sort of curtails, or one of the main liberal arguments that curtails Palestinians' aspirations for a future when they do imagine, is that of, of feasibility. You know, I'm constantly faced with people telling me what, what they consider is feasible and what they isn't. For example, the, the return of the Palestinian refugees. I'm constantly told by, by many who, who uh, would be considered progressive that it's simply um, impossible and therefore can't be granted, um, which I think is an absolutely ridiculous statement to say. You know, the, the, the boundaries of feasibility are decided by um, those in power and those in, in, in positions of power. Um, uh, Richard Falk actually uh, wrote about this quite a lot, you know, especially with regards to Palestinian future. He, he argues against this feasibility argument, um, and he says that, this, that the horizons of uh, feasibility have really, you know, limited the Palestinian options um, to, 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 to barely none. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important to say as well that Palestinians, you know, even though it's very difficult for us to, to imagine a future, you know, we do do it, you know, and, and it's not like we're not, uh, I forgot to mention that, like, often when we talk about imagining, also people uh, um, throw out the accusation of fantasizing, and there is a distinct difference between fantasizing and imagining. Um, uh, and imagining is a very, very much a collective process, and Palestinians have been engaging in, in collective imagining um, in, in all their fragments for, for a long time. Um, you know, there are, there are many different Palestinian groups that sort of imagine return, um, what it would look like, the rebuilding of uh, their Palestinian villages that were destroyed in 1948. Um, there are other sort of imaginations um, of, of, of political mandates of what a one state might look like, for example, in which all the people living from the river to the sea um, live uh, under a regime based on, on equality and justice and, and reparations. Um, so there are there are a lot of you know there are these individual sort of um, actions that are happening on the ground. Unfortunately, they are, they do remain fragmented, and that's that is the, the the crux of the problem is that these have to be part and parcel of the Palestinian liberation project. But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, that we do have a problem with the Palestinian political leadership in, in that it has been co-opted into the very oppression of the Palestinian people, uh, and, and so this is you know this is our problem and i think it's the problem of 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 many people around the world that these high you know high level mainstream political spaces we're not really finding ourselves in them anymore and so what does that mean that means that you know we have to we have to do this imagining we have to do this decolonial political work elsewhere uh, and it is being done it's about bringing it together um, and to think about you know to, to think about, you know, to really convince ourselves that th these things are possible. It is possible um, to, to have justice. Um, something that I really, um, really uh, uh, admired was uh, something that Gary Young, a columnist for the, the Guardian, he wrote, imagine a world in which you might thrive for which there is no evidence and then fight for it. And I think that's particularly poignant today when we're looking all around us and we're, you know, especially under the pandemic, when the pandemic's revealing all these structures of power and all these structures of inequality, and when we're really, you know, losing hope, we should not stop imagining. Uh, and we should not stop imagining a world in which Palestinians are given the right to uh, take that right, not given, take that right to return, um, because it is enshrined um, to their homes, where Palestinians can live in safety and not fear of being incarcerated. Um, Palestinians can can live on their own land, 
you know, these are all, you know, real demands. And I think that they can be actualized and they can be realized. To say that they can't is part of the problem. And when you start saying these things are possible, this is when, this is when we move forward. Do you, have, do you have anything to add to that? I'm curious for your take on, on how we might move, uh, you know, advance this, this vision. I mean, I think, you know, Yara spoke a lot about what it's going to take for Palestinians themselves to, to imagine a future. And I'm curious to know, maybe if we can bring the two pieces of this conversation together is, you know, how can, how, what does it mean for internationalist movement to engage in that act of imagination together? Um, what's it going to require, and it, you know, I think that you know, one of the comments we've, we've gotten on the broadcast so far is that uh, I think this is very similar to what you were quoting about the situation <clears throat> in terms of French colonialism, is that the imagination itself is, is colonized and it becomes very difficult to engage in this, this act of imagination. And Brunda, you've spoken a lot about abolitionism uh, and you know, being very close to abolitionist activists in the United States, they're also their primary um, uh, barrier often in communicating their message is people just simply can't imagine uh, a country beyond the incarceral country that, that they've grown up in. So I'm wondering, you know, it, how should we understand this this three part question of, of the future and imagining the future and then imagining the future for Palestine um, in, in that sort of planetary international sense? I very much agree with um, the comments Yara made is that the day-to-day -day life of being under such violent occupation and under surveillance with the threat of life um, really like at the forefront really makes it sometimes difficult to even imagine um, a life outside of that. And I think that's what where internationalism and joint struggle really is important. Um, from um, in abolitionist movements in the United States, for example, it's really hard for people to think outside of a reform framework where it's about improving the conditions of prisoners, improving um, the judicial um, the judicial process, um, uh, removing cash bail, uh, giving more products or better conditions inside the prison. But that's not, um, but to break out of that um, and to think like, what does it actually mean to incarcerate populations? Um, and to think outside of that framework takes us to a new plane where we can actually think about a world without borders for a liberated Palestine. Um, and I think that's what we really need and where Palestinians who are facing the burden of military occupation need that joint struggle also to work with other communities um, across the world to really think about how we can break out of the conditions that we have been told are, um, are permanent. Um, and so I very much agree with what Yara said is that sometimes it's hard to envision, but at the same time, we also know so much that a word that commonly is used to describe Palestinians is resilience. So even though I think it's sometimes hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's sometimes hard to see liberation, Palestinians have never continued thriving, have never stopped um, um, continuing to uh, work towards liberation and to progressing our society as well. And, you know, just now bringing us to the, to the close of the, of the session, uh, I think it's important for me to say that it is um, certainly the ambition of this, of this progressive international that we're building now to be precisely that vehicle to be you know, doing the work that you were just sitting out in terms of um, de-exceptionalizing, uh, as well as being a vehicle for re-internationalizing in, in that way. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and first, I want to thank you both for, for making time today. I'm so happy that this was not only that we were able to do this, but that we were able to kind of lead with this um, as the first PI forum in, in, a, in, a, in a series that will be drawing attention to the work of members like Al Shabaka, but you know, far beyond, and I think because it sets the stage for us to really be thinking really critically about uh, not just you know, what's happening in different parts of the world, but precisely how we can de-exceptionalize those struggles in their own ways uh, and make sure that, that we're thinking creatively and constructively and concretely about how to braid those, those movements together. So again, I really want to 
thank you both. I know that uh, one one of you is in, in Boston and one of you is in Ramallah, so we're, we're spread out across the world here. And I just want to thank you all. Thank you both uh, for making time today. And I hope it's not the last time I see you. Thank you so much. And uh, to everyone watching, uh, this is this is as I said the, the first forum. Uh, we will be continuing to host forums uh, over the coming days, and we hope you join us for those. We hope that if you haven't yet become a member of the Progressive International, you consider going to our website, signing up, joining as an individual, or for a member of a trade union, or a member of a policy network like Al Shabaka, or you're a member of a political party, any other organization that you feel like should be part of this struggle and part of this act of co-creation. You go to our website, Progressive International, and sign up, become a member. Um, even if you can't become a member for whatever reason, we really, really rely on your uh, financial contributions. One of the most important things you could do to keep this spirit of this alive and to keep us plowing along in terms of our internationalism is making a small and regular financial contribution. So we hope you can do that, and we hope to see you very soon in a future form. For now, I want to thank you all. Again, thank my guests, thank Al Shabaka, and um, I'll see you all very soon. Have a great week.